Tom, thank you for being here. I suspect you might rather be known as a disruptor than a traditional business leader. <laughs> Both, hopefully. Can you explain Airbus? You know, we, we see it as a traditional industry, but a very secure industry, high, high barrier to entry. Why was Elon Musk and SpaceX such a wake-up call for you a couple years ago? Well, let me first uh, thank you very much, uh, Hubert and, and Steffi, for, for inviting me. This is a very irritating environment for me. <laughs> um, I used to go to uh, investor conferences, aerospace conferences, but never to an event like, like that. But I think what I've seen in the last couple of hours is, uh, is very, very interesting, very innovative, and I'm happy to be here. Well, Elon Musk. Um, I mean, when he started in the space business like 10 years ago, honestly, we didn't take him serious. Before, it was pretty crazy when he formulated his, his goals, etc. And only 10 years after, he is really disrupting the, the space uh, business. And when I met him uh, in spring last, uh, last year, I thanked him for that because uh, it was kind of a big wake-up call for us in the traditional aerospace and space industry, heavily regulated, national work shares, etc., uh, to, uh, to do it differently, to become more competitive, and, and that is, that's what we're doing. But Elon, I think, is only representative for, you know, you see quite a few of these uh, high net worth individuals in the Silicon Valley who are now demonstrating interest in aeronautics and, and space. I mean, Jeff Bezos uh, also with a, a space rocket, a reusable launcher, mm -hmm. developing propulsion together with traditional aerospace companies. Uh, I think Google is developing a UAV business, Google Wings, Facebook is experimenting with uh, satellites and high flying drones mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that also is very um, interesting for the traditional aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. So to respond, you launched two initiatives in Silicon Valley, a venture fund and also an entirely new company called A-Cubed. Could you, could you outline their goals? Well, I guess this is not entirely original. A lot of people have done, done that before, but I think um, in the aerospace world, it is uh, still uh, pretty unique. Well, we went, the story is very short. We went to the Silicon Valley with our entire executive committee in uh, spring last year, and we came, we came home with everybody saying, wow, I mean, that is, that is interesting. Not so much the new technology, but the speed with which they're doing things there. Uh, a lot of these uh, highly creative, innovative people mm -hmm. on small place. So we said we want a corporate venture fund, uh, Airbus Ventures, which has just done its first, its first um, investment mm -hmm. into a fascinating uh, a company. Uh, it's uh, run by Tim Dombrowski. By the way, Tim is, Tim is here in the first row. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Tim, yeah, st stand, up. stand up. So maybe somebody wants to talk to you mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Tim is coming from Andreessen Horowitz, has done a lot of uh, investing into startups in, in the Silicon Valley. Um, and, and next to him is Paul Eremenko. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul is Paul we poached from Google. Uh, and before that, he was working for the Defense uh, Research Agency, for Motorola, and a bunch of, of other uh, companies. And these guys set up their operations, what is for us in the traditional industry, uh, record speed, like, mm -hmm. in, like in six months. And, and Paul has just signed a project with Uber, which is very interesting, which kind of connects for the first time, well, that's the, the, the basis of a pilot project, uh, air transport, with crown transport. I mean, Uber so far is crown transport, right? So the idea is you have one app uh, and you order crown transport and air transport in an integrated, in an integrated way. Uh, not with drones yet, not with unmanned mm -hmm. aircraft, but with, uh, with helicopters. And, and also that is a, is a highly innovative project, could portend well for new business models. So, Steffi, he is announcing this news today on your stage, the Uber deal. And so this will be the first time uh, you're launching in a couple weeks uh, where, where users can actually order a helicopter through Uber. Yeah, I think we're doing it first, Paul, at the Sundance uh, Film Festival in a, in a couple of weeks. And we'll see what we, what we get out of it going, going forward.
<laughs> so can you, can, can you sketch this out? Um, and I want to go back to the venture arm, but can you sketch out where this could go with Uber? If you start with Uber and helicopters, Uber is obviously getting into driverless cars. Could you get to a point in aviation? People have said you don't perhaps need pilots. Could you see, could you see interesting developments down the road uh, with a company like Airbus and Uber? Well, I will see where we get with Uber, but in general terms, I can envisage new forms of air transportation, also individualized air transportation. I said to you uh, before when we were talking, kind of warm up, uh, up talk, <laughs> I, I'm not a big fan of Star Wars. I hope I don't get booed here, but there's one, one scene that I always have in, in front of my eyes, and that is, you know, when they, when they have all these flying cars in the streets of their capital or whatever it is on, on, on various levels. And I think we are moving into that direction because the, the precision of navigation technology uh, is clearly going into that direction, the computing power and all that. And I think it's, it's, it's not, a, um, not just by chance that various companies are experimenting again with flying cars, something uh, who would you might remember in the 50s and 60s, there were quite a few experimental flying cars, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't work out because the computing power, the navigation precision and all that was lacking in these days. And can you just sketch this out? If, if I'm using Uber to order a helicopter, this has got to be pretty pricey. Will, you, will it initially be something for elite, elite users? Do you think that the cost could come down over time? Well, we hope so. I mean, again, it's a pilot project. I don't want to make too much out of it, and we'll see, uh, we'll see where it goes. But it's the first of its kind, and I think it's, it's pretty exciting also for our helicopter people, not just for, for Paul and the team in, in Silicon Valley. And back to your venture fund. You have put $150 million into this fund. You're, trying, you're giving them a lot of uh, free reign in Silicon Valley. You're trying not to, to manage this too closely from headquarters. Yeah, I mean... Before we set this up, we, we looked at various venture funds uh, in the Valley and elsewhere, and particularly European companies setting up venture funds. And we found more companies than not who were trying to keep close control. And, uh, and, and that slows down decision making enormously. I mean, for every little investment, they have to go back to the European mother company. And, and there you have people deciding who have no clue, basically, about what it really is about, and said, no, we need, to, we need to be bold here. We need to give him a long leash, and that is uh, what we're doing with this uh, venture fund. But it's the first pure venture fund, pure play in uh, the Silicon Valley uh, that focuses on global aerospace. So everything flying, including adjacent areas like communication, like cybersecurity, uh, like, um, you know, CD printing and, 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 and stuff like that. And, um, I mean, as far as I know, as nobody has done that so far, so Tim is uh, pretty unique, and we, we hope he's coming up with a good, good pipeline. And can you tell me just a bit about Local Motors, the first investment? It's a motor vehicle company? That's not just cars? Uh, it's not really a motor vehicle company. I think they started with a DARPA project some 10 years ago, when DARPA uh, was... Um, get out an award for the first one who had an unmanned car, an auto, fully, fully auto, autonomous vehicle. They started then, and uh, what, they, what is unique about them is that they are really community-based global engineering. In other words, they have a very small staff, but they, they you know, do engineering in every place in the world, wherever it is competitive, or somebody comes up with a, with a competitive, uh, um, competitive offer. And the second thing is that they also build micro factories. And one of these micro factories we'll probably have here in, uh, in Germany and in, in Munich. And what it means for us is we try to explore to do um, development manufacturing much faster than we do today. Give you an idea, a large commercial aircraft, it takes some seven years at least to develop a large commercial aircraft. And it costs us easily $15 billion, just the non-recurring cost for development cost. So if that can be done much faster, for instance, through this global sourcing approach, if we can do manufacturing uh, much faster, and they have demonstrated with various projects that development time and cost 
uh, development cost and manufacturing cost uh, can be reduced by an order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. This is exciting, so we try, we try to learn from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of development time, what's your assessment of the Chinese and the progress they're making in aviation? You view them as pretty serious competitors. Well, look, there's a lot of um, would-be competitors out there. Uh, in the aerospace industry, we have pretty high entry barriers. This is due to technology, this is due to the enormous development costs. Uh, but if you want to bet on somebody, bet on the Chinese. And are you at all concerned or spooked? I mean, obviously, with the market flu fluctuations, there are a lot of people who have turned into bears on China. How do you, Rick? I'm, I'm much more optimistic in China. I think we need to realize that the, the stock market is the stock market. Uh, there's certainly a lot of overheating in the Chinese stock market, but the industrial world is something else. Look, I mean, you cannot exactly call it a recession mm -hmm. if a country grows with still more than 6% uh, per year. What is it in this country last year? 1.7, 1.8 or 9%, uh, I don't know. Uh, global GDP growth is projected at 3% or less than 3% right now. Um, and, and if we look at air traffic, the Chinese air traffic crew, we don't have the final numbers, but from 14 to 15 most likely by at least 10% again. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish on, on China, yes. Mm -hmm. So today the news is the lifting of sanctions uh, in Iran. Uh, it's a huge market. My understanding is they have some very old airplanes. Um, is this going to be a tremendous opportunity for Airbus? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for a lot of industries. Um, and if you look at the, the aircraft, yes, they have uh, currently flying very old aircraft. I think the assessment for uh, the number of new aircraft that they need in Iran is uh, like 400, 500 aircraft in the, in the coming years. It's a huge country. It's, uh, it's a country with uh, a lot of engineering talent. Somebody said to me the other day, if the sanctions had one beneficial effect, uh, it was exactly that, that we were thrown back to our own devices and had to, had to educate our own engineers. So this is a, is a huge market, and I really hope that uh, those who are, let's, let's, let's be careful here, uh, party to this agreement, uh, really don't screw it up, because I think uh, not just in terms of industry, but also in terms of the benefit we would get for security in an area that is not the most secure, in other words, pretty unstable, uh, would be positive, and we don't have that many positive news, geopolitical news, I think, at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think any specific countries will have an advantage, the U.S. over Germany uh, or, or industries, I guess there is a lot of pent-up demand for planes in particular. Well, when it comes to planes, it's not the U.S. versus Germany. It is uh, the U.S. versus Europe, so to say, because mm -hmm. we, are, we are a European uh, company. No, I think, uh, I mean, in most markets today, we are in a duopoly. In most markets, uh, sometimes it takes a little time, uh, we are in a 50-50 relationship, and that is at least what I would expect also in the Iranian market. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit about Europe. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of talk at DLD about regulation. Um, you voiced frustration um, about, uh, you know, about over-regulation of aerospace and, and some concern about tech. Uh, uh, you recently wrote an essay saying that Modi had it right, that um, government has no business to do business. What would your, what would your request be of European authorities? Well, that very sentence was actually a quote from Narendra Modi. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I happened to be in one of his speeches uh, last year in, in uh, Bangalore, and he was saying government has no business uh, to do business. No, look, I mean, we can cut that short. You, you, you dealt with that already mm -hmm. in various sessions uh, this afternoon. I think governments should make sure there's the right infrastructure. Uh, governments uh, should, uh, um, you know, have less regulation. Larry Page was saying, uh, in an interview when he was asked, I think it was last year, um, that we thought that a Google could be created in Europe as well. He said, uh, no, I don't think so, because Europe is overregulated. I think that, that, says it, that says it all. That's mm -hmm. a huge issue, and I think it has been discussed this, mm -hmm. this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to why you're making such a push into tech right now. Uh, you told me that actually of all the data that Airbus uh, accumulates, that, that you use only 
one percent of it. What are the what are the implications of that? Well, I won't give you the the aircraft uh, the, the Airbus number because that is classified. Okay. But um, <laughs> if we look at the, the industry overall, the number I saw recently was that uh, point less than point one uh, percent of the data that is generated in industry, traditional industry, is really used. I mean, we were, um, and, and, and the aircraft industry is an industry that generates tons and tons of, of data. Uh, you take a flight from Munich to Barcelona or Madrid, it's easily a terabyte of data that is generated. We were measuring in the 80s, 20,000 parameters, 20,000 parameters on an aircraft. You think that's a high number. Now today, uh, we are above 450,000 parameters, so you can imagine what uh, amount of data we are generating. So yes, we are now going systematically after this data with data science, with data analytics, and one, one of the things that, that stands out very clearly for the aeronautic um, industry is that we can add value in every area in development, in manufacturing, integrated digital design and manufacturing. That's the next industrial revolution, so to say. But also in product support, in services, creating new business models. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff we, we can look forward to. So Uber in five years has become a $50 billion company. Airbus uh, in 50 years is about a $50 billion company. How much of your your push right now on tech is, is really, um, you think, one of, of almost survival for the future. Well, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not trying to make Airbus a startup uh, company, I'm, but I'm trying to inject some of the, some of the pluses, some of the um, values from startup companies again into the company. Um, we were recently unearthing a, uh, a quote from the first marketing uh, officer of Airbus 40 years ago. And if you, if, you, if you look at what the guy was saying, he said, we were typing our own letters, we were cooking our own, own coffee, nobody took us serious, etc. So in other words, 40 years ago, we were a startup. We didn't call it a startup uh, 40 years ago. And a bit of that spirit, I think we need, we need back. And uh, well, we are an aerospace company. Our, our tagline is, we make it fly. And we want to not miss creating the future of flight. And this is what this is all about, because we believe digitalization uh, and exploiting the data that we're generating can propel us into, uh, into a exciting new future. Remember that in the 40s, 50s, 60s, which was the leading high-tech uh, industry? It was aerospace. You know, if even nine years after the Second World War, uh, we were building planes, or not we, the Germans, op for obvious reasons not, but the Americans that were going supersonic, Mach 2 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it was only in the 70s, with the Vietnam War, with the oil crisis, so many things to do on Earth, that this impetus um, slowed down. So I think digitalization and all the related innovation that comes with it can, can really give a huge push to the aerospace industry uh, globally. Tom, thank you so much for a very provocative discussion. Thank you. Thank you.